going to introduce you to the quantum Hall effect. Before doing that, I'd like to make a personal comment. To me, the quantum Hall effect is one of the most beautiful phenomena known in physics. If you are in physics for the beauty of science, that's your day. So let's start from the Hall effect. In the Hall effect, in the context we're talking about, electrons flow in two dimensions. And the plane in which they flow is subjected to a magnetic field perpendicular to the plane. Now the Lorentz force bends the trajectories of the electrons. And therefore, electrons accumulate on one side of the sample and leaving uh, behind positive charges on the other side and creating a whole voltage, a voltage perpendicular to the flow of the current. So now we have two voltages. A voltage parallel to the current and a voltage perpendicular to the current, and that makes the resistivity into a two by two matrix with longitudinal components and whole of diagonal components. So if we want theoretically to uh, 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 see what we expect the uh, elements of the resistivity matrix to be, classically the picture is very simple. The whole voltage is supposed to cancel the Lorentz force. The Lorentz force is proportional to the magnetic field, and therefore we, we expect the whole resistivity to be simply proportional to the magnetic field. Once the Lorentz force is cancelled by the whole voltage, electrons flow as if there's no magnetic field, and therefore classical physics expects the longitudinal resistivity to be independent of the magnetic field. Now, we are here for quantum mechanics, right? It's the quantum Hall effect. Quantum mechanics, the first thing it does is it introduces two new notions. First is the flux quantum, Hc over E, a measure of magnetic flux. And second is a dimensionless number whose importance cannot be overstated. Nu, the ratio of the density of electrons, n, to the density of flux quanta, which is B over the flux quantum phi naught. Phi naught is Hc over E. Now we could rewrite our expectation for the whole resistivity in terms of this dimensionless number nu, and the expression we would get, B over Nec, equals to H over E squared times nu. This is just rewriting, and nu is a continuous number, proportional to 1 over B. So we could formulate our classical expectation for the whole resistivity as rho xy, the whole resistivity, being proportional to 1 over nu. Now let's see the experiment. Let's see the quantum Hall effect. So here is the, the experiment. We see in black rho xy in units of h over e squared as a function of magnetic field or 1 over nu. And what do we see? We expected a linear relation. We expected a straight line. What we see are these steps. You see this indicating one of them. But you see there is a step here, step there, and there, there is a whole line of steps. Those steps are the quantum Hall effect. Now, you know, we expected a straight line and we got steps. You don't get a Nobel Prize for that. You get the Nobel Prize for what these steps are. And let me uh, dwell on that. So you know, the, the starting point of each step and the ending point of each step, those depend on sample, depends on material, depend on many parameters. But the value of the whole resistivity at each step is universal and is constant. What do I mean by constant? What I mean is, if you look at the whole resistivity at the beginning of the step and at the end of the step, it does not change. It does not change by 1%. It does not change by 1% of 1%. It does not change by 1% of 1% of 1%. It is precise to one part to about 10 to the 9, one part uh, in a billion. It is one of the most precise phenomena you've ever seen. Now, uh, what's the value at which it, it is stuck? What is the constant value? Well, those values, look here. What we see here in, the, in this main plateau, rho xy is exactly h over e squared. 
Now that's mind boggling. You know, it's a resistivity. Usually resistivity is something that depends on material. Here we have a resistivity that is determined by the ratio of two of the four fundamental constants of the universe. Planck's constant, quantum Hall effect, right? Planck's constant over uh, the electric charge squared. And, and you see, it gets stuck on a, on a, a new equals one. It gets stuck on uh, uh, other values of new, and we will uh, see what values uh, those are. When I say that the uh, value at the step is quantized to one part in a billion, here it is. It's 25,812.80745 uh, uh, ohms. It's, a, it's quite surprising, actually, that uh, h over e squared, this ratio, has the units of ohms. But that's the way it is. So, so that's the black line. That's the whole resistivity. Now let's look at the blue line, which is the longitudinal resistivity, which is uh, 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 the scale you see on the right here. It's given in terms of ohms. Now, that's not universal, but it has a, uh, one universal feature. And this universal feature is whenever the whole resistivity is in a step, the longitudinal resistivity goes down to zero. There is no voltage parallel to the current. The entire voltage is perpendicular to the current, which means, among other things, that there is no heating because the heating is the product of the current times the voltage parallel to the current. There is no heating when you are in a quantum Hall state. And more than that, as we will see, this indicates something about the bulk of the sample having an energy gap, which also means it is incompressible. Now, what, what do I mean when I say incompressible? I mean, you can change the chemical potential of the system and the density does not change. And we will talk about that more. Now, we said that we saw that there are steps at various values of nu, and I emphasize nu equals one. What values of nu give rise to steps? So here I'm telling you the, the outcome of uh, you know, many, many experiments in, in some tens of, uh, of uh, materials, in uh, thousands uh, of uh, labs, and, and so on. And what we know is that there are two types of values of nu at which we get the steps. One is uh, integer values. And I give you some examples here. One, two, three, four. And it goes up, up to about 20, 30, you know, that range of integers. And if one type is integers, the other type is probably fractions. And the fraction that we get, that's a, a, also a list of about 20 or 30 or 40 values. And, and, here the, and you see examples here. One third, two over five, three over seven. You can probably guess that the next one is four over nine. And then you see there's a bunch of them which are kind of the mirror image of the first ones. Instead of 3 over 7, 4 over 7. Instead of 2 over 5, 3 over 5, and so on. And then, then there are fractions which are larger than 1. 4 over 3, 7 over 5, and so on. And you see all those fractions have odd denominators. But then there's also 5 over 2, because there's an exception to every rule. So, you know, saying it in a very non-mathematical way, those fractions are uh, of the form P over Q. Where P and Q are kind of small integers. You see 1, 2, 3, 7, 11, and, and these numbers. And Q is usually, for whatever that means, it's usually odd. So this is the quantum Hall effect. The integer values of nu are the integer quantum Hall effect. The fractional values of nu are the fractional quantum Hall effect. What makes this effect so amazing is the precision, the universality, and the fact that the resistivity is determined by the ratio of two of the fundamental constants of the universe. I think that this becomes even more striking if we look at the sample at which you see it experimentally. So let's look at the picture. This is the first sample at which the uh, fractional quantum Hall effect was observed. Now look at this. It's so full of details. It, it has contacts uh, uh, connecting to ampermeters and voltmeters. It has all this uh, uh, dirt, all these uh, white uh, dots. It has all, all, you cannot reproduce this sample twice in a lab to a precision of one part of, to 10 to the 9. 
and yet you get an answer from this sample that is precise and that is determined only by fundamental constant. It doesn't matter. This is made of gallium arsenide. But you do the same experiment on graphene, on silicon, on silicon germanium, on zinc oxide, and lots of, and lots of other materials, and you get the same answer. There's something here that's very fundamental. And this is why we are uh, going to talk so much about it in this course. You see that, as I said, in lots and lots of materials. And this is just basically a random collection coming out of looking at Google Images for quantum hole images. But uh, I'd like also to use uh, uh, this uh, uh, presentation to uh, mention that there are conditions to see the, the, the quantum hole effect. Uh, you usually need low temperatures. You usually need pretty strong magnetic fields. I mean, not, the, not very, very strong, but not the level of uh, the magnetic field you use to stick uh, uh, a pizza uh, sticker to a fridge. Uh, and, and you need clean samples, uh, not the ones you would uh, produce uh, uh, in your uh, study. Uh, but other than that, you have a universal effect here. So as we saw, the, the, there are integer values of nu, the integer quantum wall effect, and there are fractional values of nu. Some features are, are common to both, to any quantum hall state. Other features are different, very different, uh, for the, the integer versus the fractional. And I'd like to give examples to both. So uh, one example that's common to both is if you look at the, whole resist uh, the longitudinal resistivity, I, I said that it's zero. But in fact, as you, uh, you know, measure it more and more precisely, zero is never exactly zero. You see that its temperature dependence is of this Boltzmann type of form or Arrhenius type of form. It's proportional to the exponent of minus T zero over temperature. So you can see the, the uh, resistivity or excess going down by several orders of magnitude when you change the temperature by, by about one order of magnitude. That is an indication of the existence of a gap in the bulk of the sample. In contrast, common to all quantum whole states, integer and fraction, fractional alike, and uh, something we will talk about in great detail uh, in later segments in this course, the edges of the sample are never gap. They are always gapless. And you can see that in the, in the plot downstairs, where you see uh, uh, in the upper half the longitudinal and whole resistivity, and you see all these great happenings, cha things changing very dramatically as you change the magnetic field. But then in the lower part of the sample, you see the tunneling density of states into the edge. And you see that it's never zero. It changes here and there, but it's never zero because there's no gap at the edge. So those are two features which are common to the integer and fractional quantum hole effect. Now let's talk about features which are different. And there are two I'd like to mention. First is what gives rise to the effects. The integer basically needs the Pauli principle or the Fermi statistics needs the fact that electrons are fermions in order to exist. It can exist both when the electrons interact or do not interact. The fractional quantum hole effect needs electron-electron interaction in order to uh, manifest itself, in order for fractional quantum hole states to be created. That's one difference. The second difference, so beautiful, so much a subject of a, a, a one of the uh, segments uh, uh, we're going to see later on in this course, is the world of fractional excitations. It is the fact that in the fractional quantum hole effect, electrons break into quasi-particles whose charge is smaller than the charge of the electron. The, those quasi-particles have unique properties, uh, fractional statistics, uh, all kinds of uh, 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 other mind-boggling uh, uh, properties, and we will see those. Generally, you know, when you see a, a, an effect like that, you can imagine four directions of research you may attempt uh, in order to understand or in order to enjoy this effect. 
The first direction is you can ask yourself, why does it happen? Why do we get this precise quantization? Why do we get those particular value, one over three, two over five, and so on? And we are going to talk about this uh, uh, in the context of uh, uh, the uh, theory of, of the edge, Latinger liquid, uh, and also a uh, theory of the bulk when we talk about composite fermion theory. That's one direction. A second direction you can uh, imagine thinking about is, let's forget the question of why does the effect happen. It happens. Everyone, you know, it's seen in thousands of experiments. It happens. What, what we can try and understand is what does it tell us? Combining the, this observation that we just saw with other things we know about physics, with charge conservation, with uh, energy conservation, whatever, what conclusions can we obtain? And we will talk about that too. We will talk about fractional charge. We'll talk about fractional statistics. And we will talk about implications of the effect on localization. All those we will uh, discuss without even understanding why the effect occurs. So the third type of questions we can think about is, does this type of effect occur elsewhere? So maybe before trying to think about that, let's define ourselves, what do we mean by this type of effect? Well, we'll do it from the mathematical angle. You know that when you um, find a new physical phenomenon, you need a piece of math to uh, try to understand it. With the famous example of Newton, and the apple falling on, on, on his head, we know that he needed the, the mathematics of differential equations in order to describe the motion of the apple. The poor guy needed to invent it. But we live a, in, in a luxury of a much more powerful mathematics nowadays. So we, we need to find the right branch of math to analyze such an effect where there is a physical phenomenon that does not change as we change some physical parameters, such as the magnetic field as we saw here. This branch is topology. So the quantum Hall effect is a topological state of matter. And the question we'll ask here is, are there other topological states of matter which do not require two dimensions, which do not require magnetic field, and which are different? And the answer is yes. We will talk about topological insulators, we will talk about topological superconductors, and we will talk about topological semi-metals. All those will be part of a, a future parts of this course. And last, or last on my list here, is can we make use of the quantum Hall effect in one way or the other? Now, there are two uses I'd like to mention. One is almost obvious. If you have an experiment where you measure resistivity, the whole resistivity, and you get the same answer to one part in a billion, you can use this experiment in order to calibrate your units, in order to define what the ohm is. And indeed, this is now, nowadays done. So this is a present use. Far into the future, you can imagine, you can think of using the quantum Hall effect or other topological states of matter in order to uh, realize a quantum computer. And in this particular case, in order to realize a topological quantum computer. That's a very uh, futuristic uh, vision. And we will talk about it also in this course. So to summarize this segment, we saw the quantum Hall effect. We saw the integer quantum Hall effect. We saw the fractional quantum Hall effect. We saw the precision. We saw the universality. We saw the reproducibility. And we saw how fundamental it is having the whole resistivity quantized to age over e squared, two fundamental constants divided by nu, with nu being a very clean dimensionless number. Thank you. I hope to see you in the next segment. <music>